Lone wolfing is fun and all, but sometimes you want to form up with your pack, spotting targets from different angles and ready to suppress threats that open fire on your wingmen. In combat, you might have more dynamic, freeform maneuvers, as long as you don't endanger one another. But other times, you might want to go in a formation, maintain angle and separation from one another. Typically the lead, or number one, aircraft calls out the formation, and then everyone else falls in at the prescribed angle from the lead, or the heli in front of them, in a chain at a prescribed distance. You can find what I assume is earlier Russian formations in the ED Car 50 manual, and Google will easily get you some formations from NATO and other militaries, as long as everyone's on the same page. I'm not covering all the formations and use cases, but I will give some loose recommendations and maybe, more importantly, visual references for the shock. What 40 meters or two rotor disc separations look like what a 30 degree angle looks like. And of course, that also helps if you want to give references so you can quickly tell someone that missile came from 15 degrees left, etc. What reference points do you can see on the shark lead so you know you're flying parallel? That kind of stuff. The rest of the guide, I'm going to use lead to refer to the helicopter you're forming up with. Obviously, if you're in a larger formation and you're not number two, but falling in behind three or four, etc. Just take what I'm calling lead here to mean the chopper you're lying with and separating from. This will also look different depending on your level of zoom, fisheye lens, head movement and such. Also, if you turn your head, the stuff on the side will slide across these references a little. So look at my examples for the level of zoom and viewing angle and work from there. First, some common angles for formations. I'll show some from the ground. It's easier for me to set up the exact angles and distances. Perfect trail has them dead ahead. Depending on wind, up close, if you're lower, you could end up in their rotor wash. And any flak you run towards will have a clear shot at your whole line. Also close again, you'll only see the object getting bigger so it's harder to judge your closure rate until you fly into them or overshoot, which is worse at night. At 45 degrees, their rotor column is just behind the side window canopy strut, the front of them being obscure depending on how far you zoom out. Your closure rate with them will be a bit easier to gauge from this angle. Also, if you're faster, they'll be sliding backwards on your view, while if they're getting faster they move forwards so it's not just how they grow or shrink in size but also how they slide across your canopy reference the problem of course being you're craning ahead side of a lot of the time again depending on zoom and this will look different depending on how you turn and move your head this is 30 degrees this is 10. these angles i'm indicating with zero degrees being perfect trail a higher angle means more off to the side some documents will indicate what I'm referring to as 80 degrees as, say, 10 degrees, meaning 10 degrees behind perfectly a beam. Just, you know, interpret what's being noted. If you're in a squadron, hopefully there's a consensus on all the formations and expectations, and depending on how professional or chill, maybe you're briefed on how you will taxi out, take or form up, what to do in exceptions etc or it's called out on the spot either way if there's leeway i've got some recommendations specifically for the shark the crazy cockpit protection means you have garbage viewing angles you don't have an extended canopy where you can see out the co-pilot beside you's glazing or a lowered tandem canopy before you never mind a door behind you you don't have a second seater to monitor instruments, use sensors, or watch for power lines while you look out the side in pilot formation. You don't have a helmet display to see readings unless you look mostly forwards, nor do you have sensors with a wide range of view and down to a times one zoom to spot your lost lead that went beneath you. If you're flying 2D, you won't have the depth perception or the screen real estate covering your peripheral vision like you might in real life. Finally, you only have head tracking, 
but not the instantaneous and more comfortable ability for your eyes to dart around without moving your slower noggin to point at something. And unless you're lining up for a tightly packed far landing spot, you're not trying to land like coordinated lift elements in a combat zone, and you don't need to have a door gunner coverage. Where you're going, there's often going to be some form of threat that you should be scoping out before you get there. So, based off my experience playing a video game, I think the shark likes to space out a bit further away at bit shallower angles than some other attack helicopters might for most situations. Not every situation, just more frequently. And once you enter combat properly, you may better break formation perhaps, assign different altitude bands to separate vertically, keep tabs on data link and communicate your intent rather than staying packed up. Unless you're doing rocket runs or set positions for a simultaneous attack from a harbor say. Time spent matching exact velocity on someone else in the shark is time not fully on sensors and weapons. For distance, I'd recommend maybe 10 rotor lengths, so about 158 meters, is decent for covering your lead without worrying about colliding while still being easily visible and making out a few reference points. 10 rotor lengths means that your closest rotor tip to their closest rotor tip is 10 times the distance of your rotor diameter. Seems like a lot, but you can close that in no time. The 158 meters from mast to mast, so as you'd measure in the mission editor. The fuselage stands out more in some directions, such as if you're in perfect trail, your nose would be closer to their tail that sticks out past the rotor disc. If you could lose them easily, such as poor light or clutter, go closer so you don't have to squint. If their flying is more erratic, maybe go a bit further so you don't overshoot instantly. And especially if you're working on a public server and you just happen to form up on a rando without them being in communication and calling out their maneuvers, that way if they break, your helicopter doesn't break. Further distance also means more time and angles for at least one of the trail elements getting helmet sight and ordnance on a threat and can they link it rather than wasting time having everyone circle and lose the threat. For angles, I recommend 80 degrees low, 49 degrees and probably on your left if you can, 26 degrees off either side low or 13 to 14 degrees high. Specifically 26 and 13 if you want to remember less. So if you have to travel side by side, 80 degrees is decent. Typically the lead is already trimmed out and has less to pilot, so being slightly less than a beam makes it easier for the trail to follow. Position the lead so when you look off to what looks like the side, it cuts off just behind their wing. If you're allowed to fly higher, position them about the top corner of the sign or slightly above this chart. That way when the lead looks over they can clearly see you in the smaller top window on the sides without leaning forwards or craning their neck right around. Just note the window on the right is slightly smaller than on the left. To be on the top side window that means you're 20 meters higher at 10 rotor lengths or 4 meters higher at 2 rotor lengths. And yes, some of these free frames at air starts I'm using to film the angles, the rad alt is still figuring out life, so ignore what you see in the HUD and the dials. Now this angle is not my preferred choice, as you need to look out on the side and focusing on that instead of everything ahead. 
with only quick glances at your instruments and scopes. But this way everyone can see everyone. In hover, an abeam position like this can work if you don't need to cover your leads back and occasionally look over. With the sheer number of liveries for the shark, some combat ones without numbers and some very dark, I'll have more reference points for silhouettes, which works with the large wingspan and the stabs. But for this 80 degree angle, about the only reference point really though is that their front canopy glass will be flat, you know, rather than you seeing it at some angle. But for that, you need to be pretty close. So it's mainly check whether they're parallel by checking you don't have them grow larger or smaller in your reference. So it's not really a best references there. Also, I don't have amazing analogies for what each distance looks like at this angle. Moving on, 49 degrees has the entire heli pretty much in sight, at least up until you get close. Mostly aim for them being just behind this canopy strut. You don't want to lose them in that blind spot. If you look forwards, up close, the nose may be obscured. Turn your head to face them, there'd be a small gap. The easiest reference I found you're flying parallel with the lead was the rotor mast vertically lines up with the back of the exhaust suppressor hull and finally the main landing gear closest to you if that's down. Other references are lining the back edge of the side window on the cockpit up at the middle of the wingtip pod. Essentially where the right side green or left side red navigation light is. At night, the exhaust suppressor can be hard to see. So if you have to guess the rear root of the wing, you can go above them to more clearly make out the cockpit silhouette and see two dorsal formation lights, but the wingtip baffle usually obscures the formation light on the wing. Of course, adjust these references if anyone is banking, yawing, or pitching, much as in the maneuvers and turns, or maybe maybe crosswind. So at this angle, you can read the lead's course fairly nicely, and if they break even at a half a rotor diameter separation, you'll fly right by without crashing. But you're still not able to pay much attention forwards. As for the lead, the separate Wolfier mirrors, like we have in the DCS version, angle slightly outwards. So if you're lined up and parallel outside of these red shaded areas, then the lead can see you in the outer corners of their mirrors if you're slightly higher than them. Just know it's a tiny mirror, so you'll be a speck at a distance, and most shark pilots won't check the mirrors unless they expect to see something in it, and then might not immediately know what that angle means, unless they like, get shared this video, plug plug. To gauge the distance, if their fuselage and rotors is about as tall as these two rivets on the left or this rib section on the right side grip, then you're about 10 rotor lengths or 158 meters away mast to mast. Five rotor lengths would be as tall as these three rivets. And if the fuselage alone without the rotors is all three of these rivets, then two rotor lengths. If you're flying in a mist formation, the hind is substantially larger in fuselage and has a 17 meter rotor disc compared to your 14. The Mi-8 is even bigger with a 21 meter rotor diameter. The Apache with combat load is often more than two tons lighter than the Shark, but similar rotor length and while slightly longer, similar-ish fuselage volume. So there you can probably use the Shark scales for reference. The Huey, while far lighter, has about the same length and rotor diameter, just fuselage will appear a bit taller than the Shark. Finally, the Gazelle is about two thirds your dimensions. I could go making references for all these, but I'm figuring you've got just about enough to remember for the Shark alone, plus I can't be asked.
If you fly slightly lower than your lead, at this HUD cross section, then 13 to 14 degrees puts the lead between the HUD and this angular strut. This gives good visibility around them so you don't lose them. You're very likely to spot traces flying at them from below and you can lean your head to the side and look around the HUD frame. With the lead ahead of you now, you can scan instruments, power lines and threats ahead. The lead will not be able to see you here, neither in mirrors nor cranking their neck. So if they break unannounced, you'd need to be Johnny on the spot, lowering collective and maybe slightly banking away so your slow down pitch up doesn't climb straight into them. For separation, gauge the width of the HUD frame with a canopy strut at this HUD intersection. If their whole width, wingtip to wingtip, is a quarter, they're 10 road lengths. Half and they're five road lengths and overlapping so the outer pylon and wingtip is obscured, two road lengths. As a reference point trailing the shark, the outermost vertical fin lines up about with the outer pylon mount. Flying lower, you won't see the formation lights up top, but the strong silhouette is often more visible, plus there's less risk of you losing sight of them in the massive dashboard blind spot if you were to fly, you know, same altitude. Once you start getting closer than two rotor discs, that tail fin will be a little further out between the outer pylon and wingtip. So as with any of these references, if you're trimmed out and maintain the lead perfectly, don't fixate on these early visual markers. If you're doing it right, keep doing what you're doing. My favorite goes to slightly high, 26 degrees. Dead center in this triangular window. You can look ahead like you can with 13 degrees. You have good visibility should the lead drift. You can better see separation of the wingtip and their nose as well as their formation lights from above. And monitoring closure rate is easier than 13 degrees. Gauging the distance. If they're as tall as one of these stripes or this rib. Alternately, if they're one sixth the width of the middle, they're 10 road lengths away. Five road lengths, they cover one third the width or 80% if it's at two road lengths. The best outline I could find is the front of the winter pod lining up with the front of the Vichra tubes that would normally stick out further. The other references are harder to see. If they're not packing Vichras, their winter pod starts at the end of the air probe sensor on the nose, or that their canopy ends about three fifths of the wing length. In an almost level pitch, if the lead is positioned above this lever, about level to the zero degrees pitch, then the lead can barely make out your rotors in the mirror. Position close to the middle, then you're clearly in view on the inside of their mirror. If they'll start creeping further ahead in this window, you'll start disappearing off the inside of the mirror. At night, you can clearly see the dorsal formation lights and just, just make out the formation light on the wing, which is coming into view past the wing baffle. If you're not too low. Now some loose tips on how to fly formation. Leave the pedals alone unless you need to coordinate a stronger turn or help with a stronger crosswind. At faster speeds your slip ball goes to the right without you having any side slip or drift. You won't need pedals for lighter turns and if you wanted to practice coordinated flight put on the unguided weapon pepper and center that over your nose probe in wind still conditions. That one doesn't slip to the right at faster air speeds. Obviously you need to be confident in your control of the shark and ability to quickly glance down and toggle something or check nav without going heads down too long, especially if you're doing up close packed formations. I definitely recommend key biting whatever you may need for the formation flight segment, like lights, accepting data links, selecting PVI points, etc. Scrambling around for your mouse, then finding the toggle, getting your cursor stable on it, and by the time you're clicking, you've either crashed 
or you look up and you wonder where everyone went. And if you really need that B-roll footage or screenshot now, have the lead to it since they could be trimmed out and mostly off controls already. Now, whether you train formations from closer and like five rotor lengths or something, where you can easily see their drift, or whether you wanna play it safe and do it from further out, up to you. But like doing smooth rocket runs, this will take practice. Getting yourself set up in time so you're calmer and only need smaller corrections. To form the formation it can happen in a few ways. From taking off in unison to you trying to catch up or intercept your lead. It depends on what you're ordered to do and have the freedom to choose from. I mean, you could lock up the lead you're chasing and then use order turn to override your heading hold parameter and combine that with root mode, allowing it to bank for you. This is pure pursuit though, so it won't shorten your approach if you're cutting inside corners and you'll still need to manage altitude and speed. It will give you a circle on the HUD where they are as well as angles in the schwall. And it can also allow you to go heads down for mapping or such while the shock closes in, as long as you don't lose lock, which is more likely with visual clutter like forests they might be flying over if you're higher up. Downside, also of course, your sensor is not tracking your lead, so you can't use it to scan for threats and targets. Keep your laser off when you lock up another shock. The range indications anyway don't show in increments beneath 100 meters, so you'll need to use visual references to gauge them up close anyhow. I guess you could also have selective use of uncaging the helmet sight with auto turn and root to allow yourself to fly parallel to lead and then control pitch and collective good on speed, but ultimately you're going to have to pilot it. And with formation flying, remembering which steer points and modes you had up previously so you don't suddenly have it fly off into a wingman when you release trim, you don't have to fly it. Maybe only use root mode in close formations if you trimmed in parallel flight and deselect any PVI steer point or day link target so it only does root without task and maintains your track. How you intercept is going to depend on the angles. Um, catching up to a lead flying directly, you might have to fly perfectly in trail until you get closer to you know, have enough speed to catch up and then have them slowly drift back to one side into your desired angle. What speed you do this at and when you go from pure pursuit to for example into desired position will be up to your skill. If your lead is flying perpendicular, like maybe reforming off to combat, you need to decide whether it's safer for you to cut the corner to intercept them or slowly get into trail while being aware of the other helicopters you're forming up with. If you're close enough, get them in the desired window and angle and then close in from there, just you know, sort of drifting sideways. Don't wait for them to slip into a large blind spot for long, like one of these canopy struts, when you're up close and closing fast. Critically, slow down in time. Take your time. If they've communicated their speed, that's neat, but also monitor your visual references. If your approach is unstable, you also have a harder time gauging the closure rate, so one feeds into the other. And if you overshoot, you become a hazard and probably need to restart the whole formationing process all over. What's too fast is going to depend on your skill. As you get in line, you can check the angles as well to make sure you're lined up with their flight path, as well as ensuring they don't grow or shrink in your view, or move around from the center of that window. Once you've settled and trimmed, you might be able to divert attention to other things and scanning, while keeping them in the corner of your eye or glancing up. Obviously, the tighter of the formation, the more turbulence or obstacles or erratic the leads flight, the more you need to focus on formation over going heads down. And this will take practice and concentration. And no, your formation isn't going to be rock solid every second of the flight. It will Constantina as someone hits the brakes with a cascading effect, which you can lessen with experience and communication. In more fixed parade formations, if you're on the outside of a turn, you're going to swing out wider and higher. So you need to temporarily ramp up your power so you can speed up 
and maybe gain altitude to keep up with the lead while maintaining position in your wider turn. Your flight lead should respect the limitations of your aircraft, so maneuvers don't ask for power you don't have or has them racing away at a speed you can't close in on. More flexible formations, you might not need to increase power because then you could cut the corner and possibly switching from the outside of the turn to the inside, thus switching which side you're following them on, which has the trailing helicopter use less fuel. For landings, do what you gotta do. A fat 60 meter wide runway, if the lead lands on one side of the runway, you can be two rotor discs away at the 49 degrees. But if the land center line or a narrow runway or maybe a FOP, you'll have to be at some combination of having a smaller separation or a shallow angle, like more of a trail formation. Formations were there in front of you, of course, run the risk of you losing them if you have to pitch up a little. However, if your leader set up a nice gradual flight path, so being in formation sets you up decently as well, that's great. Unlike whatever this AI is doing. Just note, your lead may choose to kick out in a side slip if they need better sight lines on the landing spot, so watch their flight path rather than the angle, depending. Like when choosing when to hover or going at speed, or which altitude to fly, there are many reasons to pick formations or maneuvers, or avoid static formations. As said, real life will have different factors affecting it, including maybe more concern for wake turbulence, but Hopefully this has given you some insights in which her, her to approach formation flying with some confidence. This is Volk. Cheers.